Welcome back into the Original Gangsters Podcast. I am your host, Scott Bernstein, along with my co-host, co-conspirator, partner in crime, the doctor, Jimmy Bouchelato. Hi, everyone. Hey, now. And uh, there's our producer, Ben, behind the glass uh, on the wheels of steel. Uh, he's the lifeblood of this program, so we always give uh, Benny his, his props. Today, we have... We t- we know, we're, we're called the OG Podcast, and today we have the OG when it comes to criminal defense law in the state of Michigan, in the city of Detroit. Steve Fishman is a legend. He is a, a, he's a walking, talking history book, uh, has been practicing since the 1970s, and uh, has been involved in so many uh, major headline grabbing cases. You talk to people around uh, the area uh, that you know need the services of a criminal defense attorney, and and Steve literally walks on water. Steve, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> uh, so Steve has represented, like I said, almost uh, every you know has from every major era uh, of the Detroit kind of gangland underworld uh, drug industry. Uh, dating back to probably the mid seventies, Steve has represented quite a few of these, um, you know, compelling uh, street legends and and guys that are you know the guys whose names still ring uh, from east side to west side, uh, it, you know, in in the streets of Detroit and and when people are talking about it historically, uh, I want to just you know start. We're going to kind of start from the back and and then go. So I guess start at the front and then go back to and push forward. Um, Steve represented uh, had had a some representation uh, in the Black Mafia family case back in two thousand five, Operation Motor City Mafia. Um, Terry Flannery, Southwest T, and his brother uh, Demetrius Big Meech Flannery, and Steve will tell you that uh, he is he's actually the second Meech. He's not the original Meech. Original Meech in Detroit was Demetrius Holloway. We'll get to him in a little bit. But uh, they called him Big Meech. They, they called him Meech. Okay, his name was Demetrius. So yeah, a, lot, yeah. a lot of his 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 nickname amongst his okay. friends was Meech. Okay, and uh, you know Demetrius Flannery became the more, I guess you know globally is more known sure. as Big Meech, but locally Demetrius Holloway probably still holds the the right. title for that nickname. But uh, you know Terry um, was the the number two defendant in the case. Uh, almost 200 co-defendants, biggest domestic drug trafficking case in American history. And uh, Terry was represented by Steve for, for some of uh, the case. And uh, let's just jump right into it, uh, Steve. Uh, what were what were your uh, impressions of, of Terry Flannery? He's been out of prison now for about two years and trying to, you know, keep his nose clean. And I know well, there's, there's some talk about whether or not he, uh, he'll appear at a a federal trial in, in, in the in the winter, but we'll, well, but that, that's neither here nor there. I, I, I don't know anything about that, wh- whatever's going on now. Uh, I met Terry long before he was indicted. Really good guy, easy to deal with, smart, uh, low-key, wasn't anything what, like what it appears his brother was like. I never met his brother in life because I think he was already down south somewhere, maybe in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, I represented some other guys that— uh, were supposed to be affiliated with Terry and them. I don't think I ever heard the phrase Black Mafia family. Certainly didn't hear it when I first knew him. I was introduced to him by another guy that was a friend of his that was from Southwest as well. Um, and we got along very well. We always did. I thought he's, I still think he's a really good guy. Uh, not a violent guy. Not a guy that walked around woofing and talking shit all the time. Um, and then they got indicted. And as often happens when people get indicted, um, sometimes their outlook changes. And particularly that's the case if they haven't been in jail before, haven't been in prison before, haven't been charged with anything before. When Terry was indicted, he had never been arrested, at least as far as I can recall, yeah, and had never ne- spent a night. Ne- neither of them had really uh, much of a criminal record uh, or had served any significant jail time. And, and again, keep in mind, I, I didn't even know that, that his brother existed when I first met Terry, and I didn't know anything about all this black mafia family. Well, what's BMF interesting crap. is, it, I'm interested in your, what's interesting to look at it from a, you know, Jimmy and I kind of look at things from a socioacademic perspective, but I'm interested in your <clears> take on this, kind of like what we said about the the nickname. 
black mafia family was a much, much bigger deal outside of Detroit than it was in Detroit, despite the fact that it was based in Detroit. But, but I, I'm not so sure it was really based in Detroit. I mean, I think just from what I learned with the discovery when I was involved in the federal case, you know, I think his brother went down to, mm -hmm. I guess it was Atlanta, Atlanta yeah. and made a lot of noise and had signs and all this yeah. kind of stuff. And if there's one thing for sure, if you want to get white people's attention, particularly law enforcement's attention, put up a big bunch of billboards, billboards and yeah. start talking shit on television and radios because <laughs> right. you'll get their attention. Which is what and happened. The and last it... people's attention you want to get right. are those kind of people. The guys who really knew what they were doing, kept a lower profile, yeah. kept their mouth shut, and eventually everybody winds up getting caught. Sometimes it's on a humble but when you do it to your own self, which is really the way it looked to me yeah. from looking at the That's discovery. what happened, Steve. I mean, it's not, there's no you really know. like, there's no way to massage the facts. And I know Demetrius, I know Terry, uh, I've talked to both of them at length about this. And, you know, it's, it is what it is. I mean, Demetrius owns up to it now that his behavior was, was, you know, negligent. <laughs> yeah. But, the, but the real question is, is what, what was he thinking then? He said, I mean, well, we, I'll tell you what he says now. He says, I was uh, too messed up on drugs to really be thinking straight. Okay, it's possible. <laughs> but I, I, I get the feeling when people do stuff like that, they're too messed up on ego. Yeah, well, that's part of it. And running that is, around that is part and of it. Who, has the, who has the biggest dick and all that yeah, kind of and stuff. That's, but that still exists today with big guys. <laughs> Well, that, again, I don't. I still never. No, met I'm him not or even talk talking to him. about the, the 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 case, the 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 legal uh, machinations. I'm talking about in pop culture, in America, in the world of hip hop. Demetrius Flannery and, to a lesser degree, Southwest T are godlike figures. Well, again, not having met him, I, I can't imagine that they're brothers. It, it seems like they're 180 they're totally, degrees yeah. apart. Right. Well, I mean. That's why they haven't Terry, always gotten along. They haven't always seen eye to eye. And right now they're not on speaking terms. <laughs> well, you, you know, the again, going by the discovery in the case and the indictment, um, if I were in Terry's shoes, being here, being kind of quiet, nobody was making a lot of noise around here. We didn't have very many cases around here. And if I wound up doing the kind of time he wound up doing because somebody was making a lot of noise down south, I don't know that I'd be the happiest guy on the planet either. Yeah, well, there's no question that... Uh, even though Demetrius wasn't caught any wiretaps the way that Terry was, there's no question that Demetrius's behavior and being so brazen and so audacious and taunt, I mean, outright, outright taunting the authorities. I mean, they, they put up one of those infamous billboards across yeah. the street from the Atlanta DEA office. Yeah. So it's yeah. like you can only poke the bear so much until they're going to come after you. And Terry, like Steve referenced, you know, yes, Terry was caught on tapes talking about what Demetrius was doing down south, but Terry was known as the, as the stealthy one, the one that kept his head down, the one that he, he didn't really know about the way you knew about Demetrius. And that was orchestrated. That was by, by plan. Terry yeah. didn't want people to know who he was. No, Demetrius I, wanted to be on billboards. I didn't even know about Terry until... Yeah, the the book came out and you're reporting. I mean, you knew Meech was just from pop culture. I didn't. I didn't even know he had a brother that was involved. Because yeah, Meech is the one who's getting shouted out in every right. rap song, right? You know, every day of the of the week right. for you know, fifteen, seventeen years after they were arrested, no one shouts out Southwest T. They're shouting out Meech. It's funny when you say Southwest T. That the first time I saw that phrase was in the indictment. Yeah. I, I never heard anybody call Terry that. Yeah. I certainly never called him that. He was just Terry Flannery to yeah. me. And all of a sudden he was Southwest T. You know, we've <laughs> talked a lot about in past episodes when you're, you know, breaking down, you know, from a criminal aspect that there are certain, <clears throat> you know, uh, X factors uh, with a criminal. And, and, and in the same way, there are certain X factors with an attorney. Like uh, we say, you know, uh, to be a successful criminal or to be a successful mobster, a lot of times you need to be. You know, feared, beloved, and respected. In the legal profession, a lot of times you're either a guy that's known as great in a courtroom and as someone that's great in front of a judge, in front of a jury, and, and then there's also attorneys that are known as great negotiators, great wheelers and dealers, and you're you're like the perfect package. You're someone that can do both and do it at an incredibly high level. Was that something that was, you know, a, a, a plan to like kind of have that, you know, hybrid nature to what you do. Well, I, I don't. I don't think. I know you just made a distinction as if there's trial people and then there's wheeler dealers. 
if, if you're going to do what I do and what those of us who do criminal stuff who've been doing it for many years, you have to do all of those things. Right. You got to keep in mind, Scott, there's not a very high percentage of cases that go to trial. Right. Now, very, very back, small percentage. Back then, a lot higher percentage went to trial because you didn't have Facebook. You didn't have cameras all over the place. And basically, if a guy was charged with a homicide and if he, if he killed an, a shithead, not somebody's grandmother or some eight-year-old, then you have some other shithead who's the witness against him. He's easy to cross-examine because he's a street guy. And for people like Otis Culpepper and I, we knew all the street stuff. And all the jury had to think about was, do I believe this guy beyond a reasonable doubt? And most of the time when Owen and I tried those murders, we won. But now there's going to be video showing the guy running. He's he's an idiot like a lot of these young there's guys. There's also the, the, what I call the CSI effect where you have all these people that have watched all uh, that these helps procedurals. The that, that, that helps, helps the you guys? I, I don't know. I, I don't go to state court anymore. I just got tired of it. Yeah. Um, but, I, no, I think those things hurt the, the government. I really do. Because it because raises the bar, gives it the higher threshold. A, anybody – I don't watch television, okay? I, I, I don't – other than the ball game. So I don't know anything about any of these things, but I have heard from prosecutors, particularly federal prosecutors, that they've had cases where sometimes they've lost them even, which in general they don't do over there, not too often, but they've had cases where the jurors are expecting things that are just completely right. insane. But where do they get it? They watch TV, but if they're not, if people aren't smart enough to know, whether it's watching this crazy show where Beach's kid is on, yeah, this the, is the TV. Black Mafia family show. This is TV, this is not real life. And yeah, they you, try to be, pretend it's real life. And a lot of people, keep in mind, there's a ton of people. The reason all this stuff has so much popularity, the reason you guys have been able to make a living out of gangster crap, tons of people really love gangster shit. You know why? Number one, they deep down kind of wish, God, I wish I had the balls to do that kind of stuff. Because no one, nobody has more balls than dope dealers. Why? Because they know... There's no tomorrow. There's no concept of tomorrow or next week. The next day could be you get nailed, and in the old days, over 650, you can get life. Even now, you can get 20, or you get shot, which is basically what happens to most of the guys. Yeah. Either they go to the penitentiary or they go to Boot Hill. So when people, they like to watch it, but most people got enough sense not to get involved in it because you're only going to one of those two places at the end of the day. But it's obvious the attraction of this between the movies, the TV shows, this show. Who right. the hell should give a shit what happened back in 1982 with Demetrius Holloway right. and Clifford Jones? I mean, who, who cares? But, there are, but they a lot care. of people, there are a lot of people that they, care. They care. People stop me. I get stopped. I, I can't tell you. I'm getting gas. And a brother will come up. Hey, man, ain't you Fishman? Yeah. yeah, man, come on, you got to take a selfie with me. And I'm looking at the guy, <laughs> why? Uh, man, it. you represented my uncle in 1981. And I'm looking like, man, that's 40 years ago. Who gives a shit? <laughs> I got, an, I got a good ago? segue here. Uh, <laughs> and we can jump into one of his most uh, famous clients. So I don't think I've told you this, Steve. I, I had some correspondence probably in the last year to 18 months with uh, Demetrius Holloway's uh, widow, who is not a big fan of mine. <laughs> and she made that very clear. Really, uh, I don't remember you telling me that. And uh, sent me some uh, some choice words. And and I hey, and I have no problem uh, being on the receiving end of it. And I have no problem engaging with those type of people. Um, but she was basically saying exactly what Steve just said. I don't understand why people still are talking about this and why people care. And I wish you guys would just shut up and let you know Demetrius's memory. Uh, you know be what it is and not glorify it. You hear that from a lot of the Italians, too, like the relative. And, not, I'm not saying you personally. Yeah. I'm just saying that's a sentiment that I've heard and from, I, from I don't, Italian I don't relatives. Say I, like, I know Demetrius Jr., but I know a lot of people that know Demetrius Jr., and I've interacted with him uh, once or twice. So, and, here, so here's the thing. She's right. Well, I don't know what choice word she said, but she's right. I said, I, I said, she's that. absolutely right. She's a good person. She lost her husband while she was pregnant with her son. Yeah. When it happened, it, it happened. It was so crazy, you know, where it happened and all that that kind of stuff. And she's absolutely right. That was thirty two years ago, yeah. for God's sake. Nineteen ninety. And, and I can tell you, she was pregnant, and then she gave birth to the boy. And when my son was in high school, he comes and he tells me he was playing, playing ball basketball somewhere. <laughs> and he said, he said, Dad, 
He said, did, did you know a guy named Demetrius Holloway? I said, yeah, I knew him really well. He says, I think I've been playing with his son. His son is a great kid. And my son and his son are friends to yeah. this day. He went, his son went to Andover, which is not yeah, Bluefield Hills. Yeah, and he's a decent I, I've, player. I've heard that he's just he's a great, a kid, great and kid, and he's a regular kid. Yeah, nothing and, like his... And quite frankly, what his mother's saying, I'm sure that Demetrius Jr. would say the same thing, except he's younger and he's not going to you know, yeah. go nuts on you. He, he, here's a kid. He wasn't even alive. He didn't know his dad. When his dad was alive. And now he's got to listen to this kind of shit right. and talking about stuff that happened 30, 40 years ago. So she's what, right. I can tell you that. No, and I and I and that's why I have no problem taking those phone calls and, and interacting with those type of people over messenger or email. Um, I, I, and I don't necessarily blame them for how they feel. But I mean, the only thing I'll, you know, will say about specifically something like Demetrius Holloway is, yeah, there's some baked in inherent in negativity and and uh you know a, a dark narrative but someone like him i mean my reporting and my writing has been pretty i mean i i, I pretty reverential like i'm telling everyone what a big deal this guy was how beloved he was how so it's not like i'm out here uh, you know trashing him no or, i think but but that that's look at meech was a great guy and if he had gone into something different if he hadn't been raised yeah. rough like he was and if he hadn't gone to jail for stealing he from the box cars, People forget, he, he could have been a ceo yeah. of a corporation he had charisma he had the ability he didn't drink, drink or use drugs he had the ability to lead it, like a lot of guys that i represented that were in that business and had he been in a different situation in a different time he he would have been a regular person i think what what she's saying is that it, it's because no matter how, quote, reverential you want to be about it, all that it's being brought up in relation to is drugs and yeah. drug dealing. Yeah. And Meech was a great guy. Uh, we we had we went to fights together. We we did a lot of stuff together. Obviously, we didn't do any, I didn't do any of the things that he was doing that uh, that led to his demise. He, he, let's also be clear. He although the feds were building a case, he was never indicted for on a drug conspiracy. Well, it wouldn't have been too long. No, they would have hit him. He was killed in the fall of ninety. It would have it would have dropped uh, either by the end of ninety or or by. I don't early know if 91. they were that close, but they were already. Yeah, there was a grand jury. They, they were already doing doing stuff with him, and you know he'd have got a lot of time. And he had a very. I also want to point out when we're talking about it, and Jimmy, I want you to chime in here. You know, for someone whose legacy and memory and reputation stretches so wide you know like we're saying 32 years later people still talk about him in, in, in a similar way that they talk about demetrius flannery nationally demetrius flannery had a fifth was was out and about for 15 years demetrius holloway had a five-year run of when of notoriety um so i mean it was relatively small from the time that the public became aware of who demetrius holloway was and when demetrius holloway died well unless you know it's a long time ago he came home i think it was 85 it seemed like it was before but maybe not he came home and he had a pistol case and he was he had come home from the feds i think yeah he had done he did some time for a, a bank robbery or a car I, I, I don't know stealing from box cars yeah, was yeah. what i thought it was but in any event stealing from the um, train it was like a, came, a train robbery yeah, but I, it's, I mean, right, not train. like he just Jesse, up a train. Like Jesse James, no, right, not like that. Yeah, Jesse, yeah. it's stealing the, the train <laughs> right. stops and right. tries to yeah, go yeah, in yeah, yeah. and get box cars. I mean, it was, the whole thing was a bunch of crap. <laughs> but he came to see me. I didn't know him, and nobody knew him. And he said he had this pistol case felon in possession in front of Judge Woods, and he had heard about me and he wanted me to represent him. And he did not have much money at all. And so I, and I didn't charge a whole hell of a lot of money then. I didn't, I don't charge a whole hell of a lot of money to this day. But in any event, I told him a fee and he said, well, I only have X, but don't worry, I'll pay you. And he did. A little bit here, a little bit there. And we went to court, jury trial in front of George Woods, and he was found not guilty. And then if that was 85, if maybe it was 85, two or three years, two years later, that people are talking on in the streets about Demetrius Howard, Demetrius Howard. I'm thinking the guy who had the gun, who had to bring in the money, you know, every week or 10 days. Yeah. And that was him. Uh, we never, we took a plea once. We, we won that case, federal court. 
We won a jury trial in state court where they planted drugs on him. They stopped him for a traffic stop and planted some small amount of drugs. It was a joke. And he was more, I mean, in terms of image, he was more businessman than B-boy. I mean, he dressed in three-piece suits. Yeah. Well, I don't and, know about three-piece suits, but yes, he was He, he was wasn't clean. someone that was running around with a gold chain and a puma no, no, tracksuit. No, no, he wasn't, he wasn't that way at all. Yeah. And then the only thing we ever, can't say we lost the case, we pled guilty to a ticket in state court cursing in front of children. He was yelling and screaming at somebody, and there were a bunch of school kids there, and they gave him a ticket. That we were guilty of, and he paid his $500 fine. But the real charges, we won the federal trial, and we won the state trial, and then they were getting the big federal case together. And he liked, the, gam he he liked the gamble. He liked, oh, the, he liked to gamble. He liked to gamble. He liked to go on these weekend liked jaunts to, gamble. to Atlantic kidding? City and, uh, and Vegas and these hear stories. These guys gambled yeah. like crazy people. But it wasn't illegal. And they were but very close. And, 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 and Demetrius and his group of guys, you know, grew up with Tommy Hearns and a lot of those Kronk Jim uh, boxers. So, so did, they were like his aunt. They were like Tommy's entourage at a lot of those. Fights. Was he close with uh, Daryl Chambers? I don't remember. Yes. Did we did we talk yes. about that? With yes. I, I can't remember. Yes. Okay. And Steve, we can talk to, uh, about that trial in a in a little bit. Steve yeah. was didn't represent Daryl. He represented. Daryl's co-defendant and got Daryl off. And I talked to Daryl on a lot of different no, occasions. No, I got his his co-defendant was Donald Donald Curry, Curry the, the fighter. welterweight champion, the welterweight yeah, champion. Yeah, yeah, and he was found not guilty. Right, you got him off. I got him off. Now, right, that's what Dar I'm Daryl had no. He, right, he Daryl. No I whenever I've seen Daryl, the case was overwhelming against him. But I said to Daryl, and Daryl, I, I don't want to speak for Steve, but Daryl told me that he helped. Donald pay some of his legal bills. So I'm like, Daryl, <laughs> you should have been paying for Steve to be your attorney. Right. No, no, he had a, he had a wonderful, he had Jim Howarth as his lawyer. Yeah, the ca the case was impossible. It was impossible. A guy had set him up whose last name yeah. happened to be Curry. Chambers. Or Chambers, no. right. The guy's name was Chambers. He was a paid informant. Yeah, we, did, we, did a whole, we did a whole episode I remember with Daryl. We, we had Daryl in here. Yeah, yeah. For, former dope dealer. And, yeah. and he was taping him. Yeah. And the guy testified against Donald Curry as well, but he didn't have Curry was there. There was a lot of kilos. He was there, but they really never were able to show that he was part of the conspiracy. Well, was, part. And, and I, you know, we talked about it with Daryl. And I'm let's just get kind of we can deal he's with it another, right now. He's another good dude. Yeah, Darryl's yeah. A good oh, he's guy. an he, excellent guy. You know, yeah. he, if it wouldn't have been for Hearns, you know, he he, he was like seventeen and two or eighteen yeah. and two. Yeah. But Hearns and Hilmer Kenty and Milton McCrory were there, and they, you know they were world champs. Daryl was a hell of a fighter. Yeah, hell of a fighter. And I. I, I'm of the belief, and I want to get Steve's take on this, that because you had a lot of guys that were from the drug world that were hanging around um, Kronk and some of those fighters, you had a target on their back. You had, a, 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 you know, we can talk about that. We've talked about this before with the Flannerys. When you have African-American men making a lot of money and having a lot of power that scares people. Uh, those, those guys, those guys were black guys. There, there weren't any any Kenyans or any. They, they weren't Africans. They were black guys. No, African Americans. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm I don't gonna... use that phrase. Okay, okay, black guys. Sorry. Uh, and <laughs> I thought he meant they were from. Kenya. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm saying that the the government wanted to jam up Tommy and Emmanuel. Yeah, they suspected that Tommy and Emmanuel were taking money from Demetrius Holloway, Maserati Rick, Daryl Chambers, and helping them you know, launder that money and they couldn't end up, they didn't end up getting Tommy or Emmanuel. So they jammed up Daryl. No, 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 that's, that, you they, don't think look, that's true. Neither Emmanuel Stewart nor Thomas Hearns, as far as I'm concerned, were ever involved in anything having to do with drugs. And you're right. It's because they were black guys. And because these were guys from their neighborhood. And unfortunately, unfortunately, just because guys become dope yeah. dealers, doesn't mean they're not going to want to hang I'm around with people. I'm not saying they were laundering money. So, I'm saying the, there were FBI investigations they, into those guys. They, I don't know about that. There were rumors all the time. Yeah. Thomas Hearns. Thomas Hearns was making, I mean, he was the wel welterweight champion right. of the world. E Emmanuel Stewart had a stable. Of, and Emmanuel lived a quiet, normal life. Yeah. I mean, Emmanuel was one of the greatest guys you ever met in your right. life. So I, I don't think, I think that was just, look, one of my guys got arrested one time. This is in the 80s. When, you know, the 80s, the world was a little crazier. And he gets arrested by the feds and he comes, uh, you know, they let him go. And he calls me, he says, man, he says, I don't know what's wrong with these guys. I said, what are you talking about? He said, they told me, they brought me in. They said, look, you know, we don't, we don't care anything about it. We want you to tell us about Fishman. <laughs> and 
the guy said, Fishman, what do you want me to tell him about him? He's my lawyer. He's a lot of people's lawyer. He said, no, no, he's he's around with all those guys all the time. He must be bankrolling them or something like that and blah, blah, blah. Thought you were Bruce and Cutler. They were talking about, no, because I think they thought because they thought I was a white guy. Yeah. You know, and I got a white face, but I'm not any white guy. I never have been. <laughs> so he, he, he looked at him and he said they kept on pressing him. And he, he said, you're, you're, you're completely crazy. I've known the guy since he, I was young and he was a younger lawyer. I say, I say, he says to them, he says, you, you want to follow him around? I'll tell you what you'll see. You'll see him go to the bar, and then you'll see him go to the gym and shoot baskets. If you want to go play three-on-three -three with him, you can do that. But <laughs> but that's how they think. It's, that's how you got to understand how white people are. Yeah. I mean, white people have always been like that. If you're around, if you're what they think is a white guy, and you're around black people, or if you're somebody like Thomas Hearns, or, or, or and you're you know in the sports world, and you're around guys that they, they, he knew him their whole life. Right. You know you have to be careful, obviously. And I know there I can I'm not going to say who, but a very good friend of mine who was a very big time basketball player who came up rough, he had to tell guys, look, fellas, we're okay yeah. and all, but no, you can't stop by that. No, I'm not going to ride in the car with you. I told my own son at Cranbrook for God's sake. Before he let anybody get in the car, fucking search them in <laughs> case they got weed or they got yeah. a pistol or they like to get high on something. Don't let them in your car because, yeah. you know, these cops out there in Southfield, and especially if they go to Cranbrook, they would have loved nothing more than to yeah. stop a kid like mine. He's he's Mixed. black. Yeah. He's a great basketball player. And it's my son. They would right. love yeah. to mess with him. You got to yeah. think like white people if you're going to be out there and get get back. That gets back to Meech, to big Meech. He, 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 I guess he's told you this. He should have been thinking ahead of time. Look who I'm trying to fuck with. These are the people that run this country. These are the people that, I mean, slavery was what they did to you guys, to us. They had, say, they had you know. 12 years. The whatever, uh, it, Steve's right what he said at the beginning of the, the, the interview about they haven't always been known as Black Mafia family. That's a moniker that really took form at the very, very end of their run and through most of their run, they were just the Flannery brothers. I don't think they had branded themselves the way that they're branded now. But, but I don't think Terry ever branded himself that. Well, now Terry's branded himself. Uh, we can get into the weeds well, a little bit. there's a popular TV show. Well, no, no, but, no, that's but Terry, has an off, Terry has an offshoot that he calls 263. Yeah. The 263 crew, which is an offshoot of BMF. Whatever. I, I don't and know he's actually selling... That. Uh, gear right now. Yeah, that's what I mean. Two six three gear, yeah, he and could. he's selling two six three weed. Hey, yeah. man, hats off to Terry for trying to be an entrepreneurial uh, when, when he when he's well, gotten out. But of, he uh, but he's similar again. He's he's another guy. He, he was a good leader. He's yeah. smart. Had he done something he's very different, network, and had he had the the entree. See, that's the other thing that people don't like to talk about, particularly white people. You know, a guy like Maserati Rick, he was a pain in the ass in a certain way, but he was he had leadership qualities. He was smart. He was nice looking. He was athletic. The problem is, is that a lot of the most of these guys that we're talking about, they never had any entree into the white world. They, they, were, they were raised where they were raised. They were around who they were around. And they never had the opportunity. You know, people like to say, oh, he should have gone and done this. Yeah, it's easy to say. But if you're 16 and all you're seeing around you is criminality and guys are robbing boxcars or doing whatever the hell they're doing, this is what you wind up doing. And then once you get caught once and now you get a record, now what are you now? Oh, you're just another brother from the streets and got a yeah. record. It's, 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 it's just not as simple. But what, I was say what I'm saying, though, is that for 12, 13 years, they existed and nobody knew who the hell they were. And for whatever reason, Demetrius decided – there's no reason to be the biggest drug kingpin of America unless people know that I'm the biggest drug kingpin in America. And then he goes on a PR campaign and brands himself and his group, Black Mafia Family. And then in less than two years, it all comes crumbling down. And you had just spent over a decade being able to do what you did silently and successfully, and you, well, you flipped the boat. That's that's the nature of the beast, unfortunately, yeah. is that too many people. Now, he's not the there are other guys who were involved in drugs that knew how to keep it quiet and th didn't make a big deal, didn't dress up fancy, didn't drive around in fancy cars. But those people wanted to not get caught. You yeah. know? I mean, Meech, I would guess, if you really asked him straight up, he had to know he was going to get caught, and it didn't bother him because it was worth yeah, it he, to he, be he, what he was. See, it was this worth is, it this is what I've learned, and I'm, I'm also interested to get your take on this. I've learned that a lot of very, very successful criminals even in some cases sophisticated criminals have a difficult time really understanding what a conspiracy is 
They have a difficult time? Yeah. You can go on Google and read about it. I'm you? just telling you, Demetrius, I think, was of the opinion, yes, I'm going to have to go to prison for some period of time. But Demetrius didn't realize the extent of that conspiracy, even though there was no violence, and even though Demetrius himself was not caught with any drugs, the extent of that conspiracy was so big that he was looking at a life sentence. So when he copped a plea to 35 years, to him, he... He didn't understand the number. And what, I'm like, well, that's just, it, it's the law. It's, it's, the cons it's the way that a conspiracy is built. It doesn't matter if you didn't touch drugs. It doesn't matter if you didn't commit any acts of violence. I, I, I have a hard time agreeing with the notion that guys involved in the drug scene at that level don't understand. I've never heard I'm about saying, people I'm, going to prison for no, a conspiracy. No, I'm not saying that they don't understand what a conspiracy is. I'm saying they don't understand the fundamentals that, it ain't five years. It ain't 10 years. This, this, these are uh, basketball sentences, as they say. These are 50, 60, 70 year sentences, not baseball sentences. Five, six, well, they're, seven they're, years. Well, there's their original sentences. Terry got 30. They got, well, they, they both copped 30. To 30. I think it was 30. I think it was 30. 30. They copped the 30. Th those sentences were, in, at that time, those were the highest sentences that I had heard of yeah. in a, just a drug case where right. there's no dead people. Right. And part of it, yeah, I don't know. I can't say. I got off the case, and I don't know how it worked there. I know for sure that Terry Flannery would have got less than that had I stayed on his case. Yeah. Because there was no reason for him to get that kind of time. There really wasn't. I mean, it was a lot of drugs. Almost all the big drug conspiracies, there's a lot of drugs. But in neither case, throughout that entire 185-person case, uh, 137 counts, Neither Demetrius nor Terry were ever caught with drugs or in the possession of drugs or anywhere near where there were drugs. Well, when they I stopped. Thought, I thought in Meech's mansion they found dope, didn't they? They found some like ledgers and they found some they didn't find residue, any powder? residue. Yeah, but okay. you got you gotta keep in mind what everybody forgets what everybody forgets about federal cases. It's like what you guys asked me the last time about pony down and, and the YBI. It, it, it it's not the drugs, it's they'll have drugs. They found what, two hundred and fifty keys out in LA somewhere. In a garage, or so they'll have drugs. They don't need to catch the kingpins with drugs on them because when will the kingpins ever have drugs on right. them? If, if I had to argue it to a jury as a prosecutor, I would say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, do you seriously think right. that Terry Flannery's carrying around kilos? That's why he's got all these other guys. <laughs> right. That's why there's 76 people or 26 <laughs> people sitting yeah. at this table because yeah. Jones over here and Smith over there, they're the schleppers. They're right. the ones carrying the drugs. What matters is, and what people don't understand, <laughs> it's the wiretaps that get them yeah. and it's the snitches that get them. They find drugs. They find enough drugs in each one of these cases. And they find huge amounts of money or jewelry. You got to remember when Terry was arrested. Terry and Demetrius, they, they're, they're forget Demetrius. On them. Terry is forget that. Terry is stopped in a vehicle. Yeah, and they got three million dollars of jewelry worth of jewelry. Yeah. And, and now, what exactly is the explanation for that? When well, you he haven't said had he a was job? going to a, a, <laughs> a young care. Jeezy, uh, yeah, I understand. Rap video shoot, right? But whose jewelry was it then? Right. And then where did it come from? Right. The jewelry went to it. jail. Right. The guy from New York, he went to jail. But the point I'm saying is that for people to pretend that the only way you can get guys who are big shots in the drug business is by catching them with drugs, that's never going to happen. Because once you're a big shot, you never touch the drugs. Right. It's the conspiracy that gets them every time. And a conspiracy is nothing more than an agreement yeah. to do something illegal. We all agree to sell drugs. This guy picks them up. This guy takes them to the houses. This guy sits in the house and sells them dime bags at a time or whatever. And I'm the boss and I collect money. That's a conspiracy, and it's a very easy case to prove. I'm, I'm also surprised at how many criminals don't completely understand that just having a certain amount of cash on you is illegal, whether or not— Well, wait, no, no, it's not illegal. It's not, in fact, in the most immortal testimony I think I've ever heard in court, Meech and I, Demetrius Holloway, yeah. and I are fighting a forfeiture case in front of Judge Michael Talbot, who was no friend to defendants. And they found about 95000 in Meech's trunk. No drugs, no nothing. And 95000 was in bundles, kind of, and it was 20s. And there were some, a lot of hundreds, too. But, and they just claimed, because he was Demetrius Howley, right. and they brought it's be stuff, illegal money. that it's going to be illegal money. And Meech testified. And he, he was a great witness. And he testified. And Talbot leaned across and said, well, Mr. Holloway, you know, you, you had $95,000 in your trunk. And... Meech looks at him, he says, well, Judge, I didn't know there was any law against carrying money. 
And Talbot's kind of went, <laughs> okay. You know, that's, the money itself is not illegal. Couldn't Demetrius have said that was money that I was going to Vegas with? Or no, he, he, with? of course he said he, it was right. money, it was gambling, gambling. money. Right. And we lost in, in the trial court and we won in the Court of Appeals, but then he got killed. And then the money, I don't remember where it went. It didn't go to my pocket, I know that. How but you... my point is, is that money in and of itself, there, there's no real charge for, unless it's counterfeit, <laughs> for having money. It's that it's the possession of that amount of money that lends credence to their argument that he's a dope dealer because he doesn't work. We checked yeah. his internal revenue service things. He's never filed income taxes. He doesn't work. And so and what's I he think doing with 67000 or 670000 The Holloway case, and this might be also difficult for his family to digest you know this part of the reporting i've done it is that this wasn't a situation with demetrius being killed because there was some rivalry or uh, war with the best friends or a war with maserati rick uh, you know that's some of the rumors you know this was and we're not going to get into specifics but this was people that he was friends with from childhood that were locked up in prison that felt like they deserved a piece of his business and and he, and he wouldn't give them that piece of his business. And that's why ultimately the Milton brothers killed Demetrius Holloway at the Broadway in broad daylight in you know, October of uh, 1990. So why so, is that sensitive to his family? To, well, cause they don't want to bring it, that up? Because when you find out that it was your friends that killed you as, a, as opposed to your enemies? Well, okay. well, it depends on how you refer to them as friends. Right. Nobody's a friend of anybody's if they right. have someone killed. Right. So. And I, I think this can, we're, we're all over the place, but Steve's got such a rich tapestry to paint from when we're talking about his career. Uh, a lot of those guys, and this was all in the mid 80s, early 90s, were guys that had come up in the 70s under Frank Usher and that whole group or had. When they were teenagers, younger mm. guys, they were in that orbit. Would you say that? No. I, I, I don't know anything about that. I mean, I, I represented Frank. I got his murder conviction reversed. I got him a new trial. We went to trial. We got the murder count dismissed. We made a deal, pled to accessory after the fact, which is all he was. Right. And I honestly, God, never, I never had any conversation. I represented his son. In federal court, once, but small amounts, and I don't think it had anything to do with his dad. But these uh, were all these were all East Siders. Well, Frank was from Frank, Frank was, was a West Sider. He was he was Northern High School. He was a North End guy. He was a uh, he was kind of all over the place. No, but I mean, he grew up in a North. Oh, sure, okay, yeah. Um, I, I I don't know anything about any of the younger guys, Meach or. But you meet Clip. you meet Usher once he's in prison. I meet Frank Usher. I walked into the courtroom when he was on trial for the murder and the beheadings. Yes. So, but just to give people so whatever know, year that we, was, we've discussed this on the on the uh, podcast before. Frank Usher was the you know the highest profile drug kingpin in Detroit in the late seventies. He had an uh, organization that was known as Murder Row. If you if you study the case and you, you get into the case file and you read the police reports, it's clear as day that he was a victim or an attended victim of what became to know, what, what became to be known as the Michigan Democratic Social Club massacre, a triple beheading. Um, but he was actually charged and convicted of it, while the people that were the masterminds of it were acquitted. Um, and he was serving a life prison sentence, and Steve uh, handled his appeal, got him, uh, or handled his retrial. No, no, I got, I, I handled an appeal and set aside his conviction. But the, you know, th that case, <laughs> when you say, I mean, the one guy who was acquitted, Doc Holliday. Yeah, but he was the one who masterminded. He, yeah, I, in the situ I have a hard time using the word mastermind for something as ridiculous it, as that. But the uh, Doc got his though. He was sitting in a bar yeah. in Linwood, and somebody came up and three shot him dead. Later, three years later, with a hundred dollar bill in his hand. Yeah, he was uh, he was something. That guy. And I think then, I, it, I, we, I think I've told you this part, and, and I'm gonna just leave, and I'll send it back to you. That I, when I was going through the police report or going through the case file, your name comes up 
in the day or two before it's the massacre true. because you were representing or going to represent Cool Cat. What happened was... Cool Cat was Frank Usher's right hand. I'm not saying that either, and I don't agree with the, the okay. stuff about Murder, Inc. I, I don't Murder Row. I, I don't remember anything like that. Okay. I don't remember that when I mean I well it was, it was I, more my, than a, my position has always been simple. If Frank Usher had been just Frank Usher, he would have just been another guy that people talked about. But he was Frank Nitty. But they nicknamed him Frank Nitty, and everybody of my age group watched the Untouchables. That's all we did on Thursday night at nine thirty. We all watched the Untouchables, and Bruce Gordon played Frank Nitty. Yeah. And that 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 right. was, I always thought I used to tell Frank that all the time. How did you ever get stuck with that fucking Tony nickname? Tony Giacomoni gave it to him. Well, that I I don't know anything about <laughs> that. How did you get stuck with that nickname? Because that's why everybody talks about him yeah. all the time. So, you know, when when he, uh, whatever it was called, it was an organization. It was a black mafia. So what happened was a couple of days before this. Well, obviously, I I didn't know James Elliott from Adam's House Cat, but. He, I don't remember if he came or what. His one, girl, it was his one, girlfriend. One of the women who got killed yeah. was in my office to hire me, to talk to me about the possibility of representing yes. him. I thought it was James Elliott. Nobody told me he was Cool Cat Elliott. Uh, and I can't remember if he was locked up at the time. This was so like, I want to say the the murders took place on July 18th. This was within the July two weeks. Fifth, no, this was like July 15th. I was going to say, it was, it was a short period of time. Because Cool Cat got locked up on like the 14th. Okay, And so it was then, Cool Cat getting locked up. So then he was locked up. So they she came to see me. I think I gave her a price. They were going to come back to me because I didn't go to, I wasn't going to go see him, you know, unless, unless they decided they wanted to hire me. And I had her name. It was like Joanne Clark. That was her name, Joanne yeah. Clark. And so I had written down her name, and I think her girlfriend came or somebody with her, not the other victim. And then they, I didn't think anything about it. <laughs> like three days later, because whoever drove the truck leaves the doors open right. or something, and they go in and they print it in the newspaper. There have been these three people found who were beheaded, and one of them's name was Joanne Clark. And then I can't remember what happened. Doc Holliday, who was Frank's friend turned rival, uh, W was waiting for Cool Cat to be off the street for him to strike out against Frank Nitty. I, I don't know all that. I know that nobody could, nobody trusted Doc Holliday. But it wasn't a I'm saying it wasn't a coincidence that it happened that when he was... Cool Cat gets locked up on Monday and people are getting beheaded on Thursday. Well, I know, and I don't remember when. It was it was long after that. He, he came to see me, and he had a situation in front of. Judge Leonard Townsend. Usher or, or no, no, Elliot. James, James Elliot. Elliot. But he was cool, cool by then I knew he was cool cat. Right. And he came to see me. He was a very tough guy. Um and I said, Well, I don't want to do anything. I think he might have had a warrant outstanding, a capious bench warrant or something. And he didn't want to go in unless he knew we could resolve it. He didn't want to go get locked up. He figured right. if that's the case, I'll just stay out here. And I went to talk to the judge and it was not unusual at all in those days. It was a small case. It, it wasn't murder. It was just a pistol or something. And Leonard looked at it, and he said, oh, he says, just tell the guy to come in. I'm going to give him probation. I'll give it to him the same day. In those days, you, could, you didn't even have to go to probation. And I remember Elliot came back to see me and because I, I, wouldn't, I didn't, didn't take a penny from him before. I said, I want to see what we can do. And so I told him, uh, you know, it'll be whatever the fee was, and everything's all set. And he looked at me, and I could see how he was what they said he was, because he looked at me. I don't think he wanted that look to be on his face, but it was. And he just said something like, are you sure? And I looked at him, as you know from me telling you before, I'm not scared of these guys. And I looked at him, and I said, even with that look on your face, I'm still sure. <laughs> and I don't know if he really believed it, just because guys in the streets are naturally suspicious. Yeah. And we walked in there, and you could tell he was kind of, you know, da 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 Leonard called the case, boom, 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 and Mr. Elliott's in. He, I can't remember what excuse I gave, but he's here. He wants to take a plea, boom, 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 and out we walked. And we walked out, his face relaxed, and he said, man, you were right. <laughs> I said, well, knowing who you are, I don't really think it would have been very smart for me to tell you something wasn't so. Do you? <laughs> and he just looked and laughed and then walked. The next time I saw him, they brought him in to testify in the Usher yep. retrial, which he didn't say really much of anything. And they really didn't have 
I, I, I think it was just a bad set of circumstances how he got convicted the first time. There was like four or five different trials from all those well, they, they, co-defendants. They, he was on trial. Was he on? I walked in there when he was on trial. Alan Early was representing him. I can't remember if he was on by himself. I know Red and Lefty Partee, I think, went to trial yeah. together. Red walked and Lefty got convicted. Lefty's one of the oldest prisoners yeah, he's like right now old, at MDOC. Um, I'm hoping to one day get him on this podcast. We got to arrange, you know, uh, Align it with the the prison calls. I think he, I think he's a, he's, he's Frank, kin to Frank. Somehow. Frank Usher cousin, and Lefty Parti were first cousins. Cousins, yeah. I think I think and, Frank told me that once. Um, their mothers were twin sisters. Uh, yeah, I never I never met I, I met Red of so times. Lefty. So Lefty's. I'm not excusing Lefty Parti. Um, I've got to know him a little bit these last let's say five years. I, I'm sure this guy was a Bad motherfucker back in the yeah, day. Yeah, I know, but you don't need but to do 60 it's like years for This that. guy is sitting here holding the bag still, you know, 40 plus years later for something that he was a mere pawn on a on a chessboard for. And again, I'm not, you know, Wait, I'm, he sure he's got, he, I'm sure he's got a lot was, of bodies. He, 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 he was convicted He was convicted, convicted of, of the triple beheading. Of, oh. of first degree murder. They were charged with in three the, counts of first degree murder. And Red Freeman was acquitted of all of them. Doc Holliday was acquitted Quitted of all of them. Shorty Fountain, they, they yeah, he really was just a guy who swept up or after the thing. And then Frank eventually, he did it. He, he had fed time he had to do anyway. Yeah. So he really didn't do Lefty's an extra only... day for the state court case. And Lefty's been sitting there. And Lef... it, I mean, it's ridiculous. He's in his 80s. What the hell? Yeah, are you Lefty's doing? like, yeah, he's like, he's in a wheelchair. He's uh... they, they let Red out. You know, Red got Red, sentenced so Red, to life. He got out. Red got out a couple years ago. I went and met At least a couple had years. lunch with him. He, uh, he was uh, someone that I can tell ha has had some reflections, and uh, I'm not. Uh, I'll share this one part of our conversation that I thought was um, pretty compelling. Uh, he said uh, there was a point in time in my life where I thought killing people was cool, um, or thought that made me cool. Well, um, he 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 did what people don't realize about about Red Freeman is that. He was not out of jail very often. He went to prison he went when he habitual. was young. He, well, no, that's the end. The last, he, yeah. he went to prison when he was young. If if you if you looked at his record with the BOP when he was in, when he went, when he got out, he really was not out of jail very yeah. often. And what they finally got him, it went back in front of Talbot pistol. again. He had a pistol. I think he was on Livernoy, if if I'm not mistaken, in Seven Mile, if I'm not mistaken, right in my neighborhood. And he went in front of Talbot. And it was just a pistol, five-year max, except he was a habitual fourth, yep. which can put it up to life, and Talbot gave him life. I, I bet that's never happened in the state of Michigan. I don't know. And his real name is James Hill. And he'll tell you that. It'd be like, Red Freeman is just an alias. He's, My real name is James Hill. Well, I think <laughs> he was doing his time as James Hill Freeman, I right. think. It, I'm pretty sure. But he, but he was one of Doc Holliday's guys? How did well, he get so this is, That's you another know, part the, of the story that's still kind of a mystery all these years later is who was aligned with who. Right. Because Parti was Usher's cousin, and both Parti and Red were supposed to be aligned with Usher, but they ended up on Doc but nobody knows Holliday's that. side. No, of no, this. Nobody knows that. Certainly when I tried the case before we got. There's so a lot of questions verdict. about this case. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can say anything for sure. When I tried the case, my way of presenting it to the jury was this was all Doc Holliday's doing because there were a couple people that were in the room, and I don't remember their names, obviously. That flipped. That turned. Well, I, I wouldn't call it flipped, but I got them to admit that I, I remember saying that what, what, there was One a, of them was a, 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 um, a doorman. He was yeah, like in doorman. his late 60s. Forrest, but I got, I got him to Forrest say that, Alexander. That, when, his name was. that was his name, yeah. Forrest Alexander. When Doc Holliday spoke, people listened. There was some kind of commercial about it. And, and yeah. my whole point, and the whole point that the, the, way we try, the way I tried the case was this was Doc's doing. Doc was the one who had brought the two killers and Usher either was just merely present or he was a target himself. I don't know if, if he, I was believe a he was a target himself. He was a target. But there was no reason for him to be wanting to do anything to these people. That's that's what they couldn't show. They really couldn't. Why, what would Frank Usher have against these people when the allegation was that Cool Cat was with him? I that, think, that's what made I no think sense. Holiday 
was afraid if he killed Usher, the Jackalones would kill him. Well, that I don't know anything about. That it wasn't anything about the Italians never came up in well, this case. Well, I'm just when I, you know, when I've talked to people, they've said that Holiday told people at the time. People ask him that question: well, Why do you leave and Frank alive? He said, "We'll take care of him later." And yeah. then Frank took off to Indianapolis like the next day because he knew that yeah. <laughs> the cops were probably coming after him and Doc Holliday would try wait, to wait, come took finish off the to job. Indianapolis when? What do you mean? Like the day or two after the massacre. Oh, okay. And then, they, and then they eventually caught him in like September or October in Indianapolis. And they were given up by Doc's uh, right-hand man's girlfriend, Cynthia Skeens, who was there when all this happened. Was the girlfriend of... That's why I recognize that name. Yeah. That's right. She was there. But the, the reason why... and that uh people would say that is usher was known i mean maybe not in in your circles but usher was known as the the main black liaison to the Italians. italian italian yeah. mafia like the main black he underworld that, he was known liaison. to be close to the billy right. and tony jackaloni right from when he was young from right when he was 14 13 right. 14 years old right right um let's talk a little bit and we're, we're winding down here but let's talk a little bit about um YBI, Pony Down. These were some of the the big, uh, you know, name brand street gangs in the 1980s. I, I know you were representing a lot of the Pony Down administration, uh, the Buntram brothers. I represented countless people that were affiliated with Pony Down, but not so much the YBI. None, except for when they got indicted. Um, Otis called me because because uh, Otis Culpepper, Culpepper was more of like the in-house counsel for YBI. Like, he, he, I don't know if I'd call it that. <laughs> in-house counsel means you know what's going on all the time. Okay, you know where the drugs are. <laughs> right. <laughs> Neither of us were that. He Steve's was pushing back. I love Steve. I love him. Well, I mean, because you got you know you're talking to people we're who don't know trial. shit from we're Shinola trial. about, know, about the world, and you got to make sure they understand that <laughs> stupid lawyers are sitting there with these guys when they're selling drugs and seeing the drugs. But Otis wasn't doing no, that, Otis and I certainly wasn't doing that. So. They, when Except they got indicted, issues. when they got indicted, Otis called me to see if I would take one of the defendants, which I did. But you got to remember, federal court was so different then. They didn't hand out time like it was lunch, like they right. do now. So big difference between the early 80s and the late 80s oh, in terms of well, sentencing. When the sentencing guidelines came yeah. out, that's what changed it. And in the Pony case, and keep in mind, in those days, there was still parole in federal in the federal system, not supervised release. And if a guy got 12 years, you get out in seven, you know, six or seven. Leroy Buttram had the highest sentence of all of our pony guys, and he got 12, and he was home in about seven. Uh, the, even the Currys, when we had them, they were later, later 80s. Oh, you were, I forgot. He was Johnny and Curry's. Johnny, uh, Johnny and Leo got, I think we got him 15, and they were home in he did 12. maybe 10. I, but when, they only I, got 12? Well, I think they did. They, they got 15 to 20, but... No, no, it wasn't any 20. I think they got 15. I don't think they were there 12. He told me 12. He, he might have, because he was right in between, see... He came in, and I think he came home in, like, 2001. He went in 80... No, no, he, he no, was... Came, he came home in, sorry, he came home in 99 and went in 87. 87 was then, but see, the, 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 the system was changing just then. They had passed the Sentencing Reform Act in 1984, and now they were... 87 was when it started. So I can't remember if they were there when the... I, I think that they were still getting paroled or, earlier. Well, was this less is the uh, beginning of mass incarceration. I just remember when I met Johnny for the first time, we were at Fishbones downtown, and I said, That's how, long, how much did you end up doing? He said, 12 years, it really wasn't even that bad. <laughs> well, but, yeah, but again, <laughs> it wasn't she, that bad. And the reason it wasn't that bad, and this is what people don't understand. Number one, you're in the feds rather than the state. So you don't have what I would call the rabble. You don't have the rapists. Right. And just the, you know, these asshole young kids, the young kids are the ones that drive you crazy, not because they're scared of them. It's just that they're a pain in the ass like all young kids are. <laughs> you know, they talk too much. They blah, blah, blah. They want to do all, you know, just all these minor little things. Number two, when you're doing time in the feds, and I don't think any of them went to the max joint. I mean, you can sh play he basketball. Down at, he was down in Texas. Yeah, I mean, but Johnny I'm saying you can, you can, you can, you, a lot of times you're living in a dormitory kind of situation with four guys. You can go, you can shoot baskets, you can run on the track. I mean, you don't have your wife and your kids or your woman and your kids, but really, you don't have all the, a lot of guys, if they're honest, and you can ask them the next time you start talking to any of them, ask them uh, if part of the reason that it wasn't so bad, quote, is because they didn't have shit to worry about. You know, when you're out in the streets, you've got so many different things to worry about. 
you know, you got the drugs, are they everything right? And and there's a lot of stuff to worry about. Are you going to get shot? You got to pay attention to this guy. Are the cops coming behind you? It, it's just a different hey, world. guys say they get their best, you know, first couple nights of sleep in prison. Or their best you. nights of sleep ever. And they they're not going to worry about anything. When they come out, guys, look, yeah. when the first time I saw Johnny, when he came home, now he was a nice looking guy anyway. But he didn't look a day older. Yeah. He didn't look one day older. He looked great. I, and then I bumped into Leo downtown, the same thing. Yeah. You know, so, you know. Johnny Curry and his brother uh, were, you know, two pretty big drug kingpins on the east side of Detroit, tied into all the white boy Rick stuff. So let's end on white boy Rick. Um, Steve, you know, never represented Rick, but uh, I know that there was a conversation you had with him uh, at down at 36th District. Or no, sorry, down Recorders at Recorders, Court. Down at Recorders Dur during Court. his trial. It's the only time I ever saw him in my and, life. And, uh, you know, Rick was at the time, everybody just knew that he was this teenage white drug dealer that was running around with a lot of black drug dealers, a lot of black women, um, sitting front row at Piston games, sitting box seats at Tigers games. So he was, uh, I mean, I even remember him as a 10-year-old. They didn't know anything about no. gangsters yeah, or I drug dealers. Him, yeah. But um, at his trial, which was a, a bit of a frame-up job in itself, but nonetheless, not to say that he wasn't doing a lot of, drug dealing at that time at his trial he had uh you know 100 150 members of this entourage that were following him around filling the court acting a fool acting like a bunch of 16 year olds because they were a bunch of 16 and 17 year olds and it really really hurt his cause and i know that steve had a little conversation with him they were <laughs> they were they were all the way through into the trial the, the problem was I mean, I've had situations like that, not as crazy as this was. If the wrong people came to a trial, I'd take them all in the hall, and I'd tell them all, you get the hell out of here. Don't come back. I don't give a shit. And I don't care what they said. I said, you don't come back in here. You're going to convict your friend. Because the jurors see everything. People have to understand that. When I talk to lawyers, they see everything that's going on. They see how the lawyer treats the kid. So... His lawyer, who I think was... He had Edwin Bell and uh, Sam Gardner and Bill Buffalino. All three of them were... Ed Bell was on that case? Yeah. I thought it was just Buffalino. But whoever it was, Sam was on that case? Yeah. I thought he was still judge then. Um, they, I, I told Rick that I, I see him. He, he knew who I was. And obviously, he's the only white kid, you know, blah, blah, blah. He was very close to Demetrius Holloway. That's how he knew Steve. Rick Bean. No, he didn't know me personally. I no, never but he met him. how he knew who you were. A lot of those guys, and they knew who I was. Right. But the, I said to him, Rick, I said, what are all these idiots doing here? Oh, man, I don't <laughs> know what to do. I said, tell them to get the fuck out of here. You can't, do, you can't have these guys around. They're going to get you convicted. And this was a but, big part of the narrative, the media narrative around his case, which was like, you got to remember in 1987, there wasn't, you know, CNN and Court TV. But as, as much as a local media could go wall-to-wall -wall coverage, they were covering yeah, Rick's two-week trial like that. And and the fact that he had all these knuckleheads, you know, following him around, acting like he was... Uh, you but know, they the were in the courtroom. Right. That's the worst thing. But, but see, here's the thing. And I've said this a million times. And when I wrote the letter for him, the uh, Granholm, when she was governor, if he would have been black boy Rick, purple boy Rick, anything but white boy Rick, yeah. he'd have just been another guy. No one would have given a shit. He got arrested. They were fascinated. Again, right. race is everything in this fucking culture. They were fascinated, and they actually believed. They actually tried to put it in, in the newspaper that he was the boss right. of drugs. Now, mind you, <laughs> I'm representing half a dozen different guys there He's who are really, really the bosses of drugs. Yeah. And this, did they really believe a little scrawny little 17-year-old white boy <laughs> is telling these guys what to do? And that <laughs> right. was the narrative that people accepted. And that's how he stayed there all those years. But it was political. I mean, part of that narrative was being fueled by the <laughs> Coleman Young's office. I'm sure it was, for people. obvious reasons, yes. Yeah. And, he, but he fed into it. I mean, and he, again, I have talked to him at length about this. He, I was my own worst enemy. I looked like an asshole. <laughs> and whether or not I was innocent or not, I looked like an asshole. But the and thing they... was, he wasn't innocent, but his lawyers didn't, whoever they were, you, you've got to take that stuff head on. You've got, yeah. to, you've got to make sure that if they're killing you in the press like that, you got to come out and say, what are you talking about? This is a 17-year-old white kid. Look at him. He couldn't boss me around. And I think one of the most poignant— They just didn't do it. They let him be, you know? One of the most, if not the most poignant part of, of that entire— Three Ring Circus was the very end when he's convicted 
and you have a, a courtroom jam packed with these hanger on entourage and uh, they're making a scene and judge Jackson, who was the judge, uh, Thomas Jackson was his judge, um, looks at Rick and says, Rick, uh, you know, you, you think that these people, these 200 people that are in my courtroom right now are here to support you and, and they're your friends. In reality, they're just here to find out who's going to replace you. And I thought that was like very kind of on point for for Judge Jackson to kind of check Rick to be like, yeah, all of this is all gone. Because the second, you, you know, you're locked up, which is going to happen 10 minutes from now, none of these people are going to care. I, I think about, about like you. the uh, the Italian mafia guys in New York when they, they go to trial, they come in with their oxygen tank yeah. and their cane. <laughs> what is what about the, the one guy, he's, the just one an guy old, he's just an old man, harmless old man. The one he's guy not, wandered the streets, remember? Right, he pretended he was crazy the, for the whole... For, <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah, he's just a harmless old man. He's no, he didn't even boss. get tried for all those years because they, they kept yeah. saying he was incompetent. Right. <laughs> Walking around in his bathrobe, you know, right. backwards. Or, but, and, right. you know, with Rick's case... It, the, the 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 truth gets lost in the mythology, and what I always tried to you know be so emphatic about was this was a seventeen year old kid that was caught in a traffic stop in front of his grandmother's house with cocaine, and if that should end somebody's life. That should be the end. That should, you know, we're gonna bury you underneath the the jail. Then we gotta reevaluate our, you know, American. Well, uh, but what justices. you're really saying, and what would be the subject of another one of these podcasts, is that the over six fifty law is right. what did it to him. Tommy Jackson would have never given him right. and his he said life, that, and he said that he'd have probably given him five to ten or something like but that. But it still you took know? Rick twenty years after that law got tossed. Right, and that's a disgrace. Well, that's when yeah. I started participating. Right. Ralph Muselli, to his great credit, yes, took uh, uh, took it under his wing, and stuff. And he asked me to write because I knew Jennifer from when she right. was, uh, and they didn't do a goddamn thing. Nope, it wasn't didn't until the film one, and the documentary. That were documentary coming out. is the best documentary that I have seen. Thank that you, guy Steve. did a fantastic job. That's me too. I was the executive producer of that documentary. Who, who what was the guy's name? Well, Sean, Sean Reck was a director Sean and I Reck. executive producer. That, that was the yes. Go finest. check it out on Netflix. A uh, absolutely, you should all check it out because it's Steve's you've got, in it. You've got forget me. You've got people from the DEA to telling the truth. Yeah. You got people from the FBI telling the truth about what happened and the whole thing was a disgrace it's a and real it's perfectly travesty. exposed on, in that documentary. Really true. And it's a shame that it it had to be a Hollywood film and a documentary coming down the train tracks to get movement from this state. Cause they I, knew if they didn't move, they were going to get ran over. I, I, I agree with you. I think the documentary made a big well, difference. This, I mean, just do the math. The first trailer for the documentary is released on a Wednesday night at eight o'clock Thursday at 11, thir that next day at Thursday at 11 o'clock, Kim Worthy holds a press conference saying that she's no longer going to oppose Wayne County will no longer oppose Rick's parole. Uh, yeah, it was plate. unfortunate that he got involved in whatever that little stupid stuff yeah. was when he was locked up. Um, that probably kept him there a little bit. Last thing I want, Steve, just we don't have to talk about any names, but I remember one of the first times I met Steve and I was getting to like kind of pick his brain and uh, I wanted to say, so you, you represent any of the Italians around here? And he were like, what I learned about representing some of these wise guys is they always think you're doing some, you're doing them some kind of favor. You're, you know, everything's on the arm. Everything's, uh, 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 you know, is uh, easy peasy and, and nobody's got to pay the piper. I, I only represented one guy who people claimed was involved with them. He's a really nice guy. I got him a fantastic deal. It was a federal court case, but uh, I made it. I made it pretty clear. From those guys. I made it. It's not a matter of. It's. I just made it pretty clear to him and a couple of the other guys that came around that you know the next you got to go get somebody else. I, but it's not necessarily for the reason that they didn't want to pay or this or that or the other. I I just you know I grew up with the fellows and I'm just much more comfortable with those guys. I, the street guys to me just. You know, you guys asked me one time, Prophet asked me the last time about, you know, when those guys from Pony, were, were you a little scared to have them in the thing? And, and I looked at him and I said, I, I, I've, I've never been scared of anybody. It, it's not a matter of fear. I'm just comfortable with the guys because those are the kind of guys I've been around my whole life. The Italian guys, I forget about whether they're supposedly mobsters or not. The only time I ever saw Italian guys was if we played against them somewhere. I just would have thought back you know, in the heyday of this, in the late 80s, 90s, when Steve was, 
And he's still in his prime, but Steve no, was no, I'm getting, in, I'm far getting, past my getting into his prime. And, and you had guys like Jack Toko that were getting in trouble. And they would go to these, I'm not trying to disrespect uh, the attorneys that they went to, but you'd think they would have been bending over backwards to try to get Steve to represent them. No, I don't but, think, I, I'll tell you why that's that's not true, though. Because remember, in those in those days, well, by the 90s, it was a little different. But, you know, I was a, a street lawyer. You know, I, Otis and I, we were doing street guys, street crime, drugs, and murder. And it really wasn't, you know, we weren't doing all that much federal stuff. And these guys were used to, you know, Alan Early, the, the older Alan Early, he was their lawyer at the beginning, and he was a wonderful lawyer. But they were used to federal court people, you know, D-Day, Alan, other guys who went to federal court all the time. I don't really think they. I, I never remember anybody contacting me other than this one case. No, I'm saying they would have been smart. Well, I don't know about that. I don't. I don't know about that again because you know I have a different way. You know, I have a different way of relating to the clients, and I think a lot of those guys, particularly the older guys, they expected a little more deference. Is that yeah, the right word? I guess that's that's not really my my way. All right, that's what I was going for. This was great. Thank you so much, Steve. We got to have you back. Uh, right. I know people are going to love this. <laughs> Don't forget um, to subscribe. Please like, <laughs> follow, subscribe. Uh, Steve Fishman, the GOAT, the OG when it comes to uh, criminal defense attorneys in Detroit. He's already ready to go. He's He's got his coat on. He's got to make it home for dinner. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, this was awesome. I know our audience will like it. And we'll be back next week with a brand new episode of the Original Gangsters podcast. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Ben. We are out.